The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome. My name is Jim Santel. I'm the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Wisconsin. Today, I am hosting the fourth of an eight-part webinar series. This webinar is entitled Information Sharing and Reentry. The webinar series is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the Indian Country Steering Committee of the U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services. Marina Henry of the Bureau of Justice Assistance has been coordinating this webinar series. And I'm just waiting for the slide to advance here. All right. The webinar series builds on the U.S. Department of Justice's e-publication called Strategies for Creating Offender Reentry Programs in Indian Country, which provides recommendations and information on promising practices related to offender reentry in Indian Country. Today's speakers include Kimberly A. Cobb, who is a research associate with the American Probation and Parole Association, Richard Van Boxtel, who is the Chief of Police of the Oneida Police Department in Oneida, Wisconsin, and Joseph Ott C. Delgado, who is the Director of the Wisconsin Tribal Community Reintegration Program. We are very pleased to have all of those with us today. Today's workshop session will discuss aspects of the Tribal Law and Order Act, sometimes referred to as the TLOA, that could affect the capacity of tribes to work with members returning to their communities after incarceration. We will also be discussing the types of information that tribal justice agencies need to consider when making transitional plans and strategies to access this information, and we'll be sharing information regarding Wisconsin tribal community reintegration program. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping matters as a part of our webinar today. First, we'll be recording this training today to serve as an historical resource for those who are unable to participate today or as a reference for those of you who are in fact attending. I ask that you continue to watch the Bureau of Justice Assistance website for an announcement of the recorded web trainings. We will be addressing as many questions as we can during the time allotted to us today. If you have a question, there are two ways you can let us know about that. First, you can raise your hand. This option is available on your toolbar in the right-hand side of your screen. By clicking on the hand icon, that will show our moderator that you have a question. And if time allows, we will then unmute you to ask your question at the end of the session. We will, of course, try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can in the time allotted. You can also choose to chat in your question. To do that, simply click the chat feature on the menu at the bottom right side of your screen. And as before, we will address as many questions as we possibly can. If we do not get to your question during the time allotted, we will try to follow up with you after the webinar to respond to your question via email. Some background information on reentry and information sharing specific to Indian Country is attached to the PowerPoint handouts, and I strongly encourage you to take some time to read this information to help put the importance of this information presented in this webinar and in the other webinars in this series into their most appropriate context. I would like to now turn the webinar over to Kimberly Cobb from the American Probation and Parole Association for her presentation and her remarks. Kim? Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the American Probation and Parole Association to this webinar and would like to thank the Department of Justice for inviting us to be a part of this webinar series. I will be speaking briefly about what information tribal justice agencies should be requesting from facilities to help them aid in their reentry process. 
Then I will turn the webinar over to Rich to begin sharing some information about the Wisconsin Tribal Community Reintegration Program. First, before we begin, it is important to define what we mean by information sharing and reentry. For purposes of this webinar, we will be using the following definitions. Information sharing means getting the right information to the right people in the right place at the right time to ensure a just and safe society. Privacy is protected, security is ensured, and quality includes timely and reliable data. This definition was borrowed by the Global Justice Information Sharing Initiative. It is important to remember that information sharing is not just giving information freely to anyone who asks, but having the right protocols and agreements in place to ensure that information is given to those who will use it in the best interest of the individual, the agency, and the community. Our definition for reentry today is the process of returning, one, returning to one's community from prison, jail, juvenile, correctional, or, de, or detention facility, treatment facility, or other out-of-home placement. One of the things we want to talk about today is how the Tribal Law and Order Act affects reentry. One of the first ways it affects it is that under Section 608 of the Act, it requires federal officials to notify tribal officials, specifically when a sex offender is released into Indian Country from federal custody. Tribes should work closely with federal agencies to ensure timely notification of this release so that release planning can begin if the offender plans to return to the to the community. The rule of thumb is typically six months of pre-release planning. The tribal agency will want to collect information pertinent to the type of treatment, programming, and services that the offender received while incarcerated, as well as the details surrounding their offending behaviors in order to make more informed decisions. Once that relationship is formed, tribes should work with facilities to develop agreements so that other offenders are notified upon release so that the tribe can begin pre-release planning with them. The Tribal Law and Order Act also enhanced the sentencing authority for tribal justice agencies. Section 304 of the bill amends the sentencing authority of tribes from one year to three years, for a total of up to nine years. For tribes that have facilities in their communities or are planning to build facilities through the Correctional Facilities on Tribal Land Program, reentry planning needs to be a consideration for staffing meaning who will do the reentry planning, what types of agreements need to be put in place with service providers, how will family reunif reunification occur, etc. Title V of the Act seeks to address the collection of criminal data and the sharing of criminal history information among federal, state, tribal, and local officials responsible for responding to and investigating crimes in Indian Country. While this on the surface only applies to law enforcement, it does trickle down to community supervision and reentry planning for tribal communities. If tribal law enforcement has access to criminal history information from agencies outside the tribal community, this provides a more comprehensive picture of the offender for community corrections to consider when doing reentry planning. Tribal Law and Order Act also reauthorizes the Correctional Facilities on Tribal Land project, which provides funds for the planning, construction, and maintenance of jails on Indian land and the development of alternatives to incarceration. Again, tribes will need to plan for staff to do reentry planning with offenders coming out of these facilities. We'll need to have agreements in place with service providers and need to look at correctional options to facilitate reentry, such as transitional housing space, reunification programs, job placement programs, day reporting centers, etc. APPA currently has a technical assistance opportunity to work with tribes seeking to institute correctional options. If you're interested in that, please contact me after the webinar and we can discuss that further. So why is information sharing important? It is important to identify who in your community will be responsible for reentry planning and supervising those who are released. In many jurisdictions, it is the probation or parole officer, so that is how we refer to them in this webinar. However, we realize that this individual may vary by jurisdiction. Information sharing is vital to enhancing the supervision of offenders being released back into communities. Without the sharing of information, probation and parole officers are crippled and re relying only upon information they can access through the individual offenders, the offender's family and friends, and the information from their own justice entity. 
Through the process of information sharing, probation and parole officers can become informed of the information necessary to make vital decisions, such as risk level, in order to make more precise and relevant reentry plans. It takes a significant amount of time and effort to collect all of the information required by the various justice systems. By sharing this information, agencies will not only be better informed, but will save a tremendous amount of time recollecting information that may have already been collected elsewhere. It is essential that agencies agree on what information will be shared, as well as understand exactly how the information shared is going to be used. In just a few moments, we'll be reviewing some of the pieces of information that probation and parole officers may want to request to aid in reentry planning. Finally, by having a more comprehensive picture of each offender, agencies can better prepare them to come back to their communities by having services and programs in place to meet their needs. Having a proactive plan in place increases public safety by not having the offender returning with no housing plan established, no continuing services to address mental health or physical health needs, alcohol or substance abuse needs, or employment needs. Not having these things in place prior to release is often cited as one of the main reasons people tend to reoffend. Spending time talking with the offender before release allows for the person doing reentry planning to not only understand what the offender's plans are upon release, but gives them time to align the services and programs they need so they are ready to begin the day the offender returns to the community. So what type of information should tribal justice agencies be requesting from facilities, whether they're tribal, county, state, or federal, or even treatment facilities? There is a lot of text on the slides that follow, so I won't read all of them, but I provide them for your information as a resource later. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but should help you get conversations started with the facilities that you deal with as to the information you would like to have access to for your reentry planning purposes. It is important to collect as much personal information as you can regarding individuals coming back to your community. Sometimes agencies outside of your own collect different information or may go back to collect historical data that your agency does not and having as much information as possible helps you make more informed decisions and keeps you from having to go do the work to collect this information again if it is required by your agency. It is important to access recent photographs of individuals returning to your community. Sometimes they acquire new tattoos or change their looks significantly, so it is good to document these changes. It is also important to note who they have been keeping in touch with while incarcerated or in treatment. This helps to inform family reunification strategies or helps you to know if they have been keeping in contact with individuals who could be negative influences once they return home, particularly important for gang affiliated individuals. It is important to gain an understanding of how the individual behaved while incarcerated or in treatment. Gaining access to incident reports can alert you to the levels of anger or violence, and some reports may contain information alluding to what may have triggered an incident, which is also important information. Additionally, for this information to be meaningful, law enforcement and community corrections officers must have a working understanding of what prison or jail rules are and what may be considered an administrative violation. It is important to know if their risk level changed at all during incarceration. Did it fluctuate back and forth or remain the same? Be sure to request all screening and assessment information that, that was conducted. Finally, for individuals who are gang affiliated, it's important to get the security threat group information from the facility. It is essential to get information on the types of programs individuals participated in while in a facility. This helps you align services with agencies that can continue or complement programming an individual has already received. Having this in place prior to release allows for a hopefully seamless transition from the facility to the community with as little interruption in service as possible. In some facilities, the staff complete daily reports, which provides information on the daily activities of the individuals they are supervising. These notes and reports are a good source of information regarding the daily habits and behaviors of individuals. Housing assignments can give a lot of information. For example, if the individual was housed in maximum security their entire sentence, then chances are the risk level remained high during their incarceration, compared to the risk level of someone who was moved from maximum security to medium and then to minimum. Employment history provides some useful information for probation and parole officers to use during reentry planning. 
The type of work they did on the, on the inside may give some insight into job skills they learned that can be transferred to employment on the outside. It also can give information as to the type of employee the person was that can be shared with potential employers, especially if they received any type of accolades for good work. Likewise, it is also good to know of any incidents that occurred while the individual was employed. This can also be shared with potential employers. Education or vocational information is also beneficial. It can tell you the special trades they're interested in that can help with employment placement or community service placement or continuing education needs or desires. Chances are you may have some of this information already on file, but a few things that should be highlighted include the status of the conditions filed, including any remaining financial obligations, such as fees and restitution. If they have been making payments while incarcerated, it is important to get the most accurate information possible to build into your reentry plan to keep those payments current. Any new charges filed against the individual while they have been in a facility, either new charges or administrative charges, as well as the outcomes of these incidents, is, is important to acquire. It is important to get the most recent physical health information you can from the facility. Specifically, if the offender has been diagnosed with any special conditions so that appropriate care can be planned for upon release. Likewise, any prescription medication the, inv the individual was prescribed, including the drug name, the dosage, the recommendations for continued use, so that steps can be taken to ensure this continues upon release. Sometimes getting prescriptions transferred from the inside of facility to outside can take some new brain. The same is true with mental health screenings. Make sure you are aware of any diagnosis that occurred inside the facility, as well as any prescriptions that need to be continued, and any treatment programs that were completed or need to be continued so that these things can be planned for prior to release. The ideal is care linked from the inside to the outside as much as possible. I would like now to turn the presentation over to Richard Van Boxtel who's going to share with you some information on the Wisconsin Tribal Community Reintegration Program. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Van Box. I'm the Chief of Police at the United Police Department. Um, I have to start off by saying I apologize if you guys can hear any background noise. It's kind of quiet right now, but they're paving our parking lot right outside of my window. So uh, if you hear any stuff going on, uh, I apologize for that. We'll, we'll try to get through this. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Wisconsin Tribal Community Reintegration Program. And uh, we're, we're serving the, the three tribes of Oneida, Menominee, and Stockbridge. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of break this down into two different sections. The first section uh, that I'll be talking about is all the background stuff and all the footwork that we did ahead of time. And then I'll be turning it over to Dosa Hot, and she's going to be talking about what the, the program is doing and what they're doing um, actually out there in the, in the field. Now, this wasn't some cool, groovy brainstorm of mine that I happened to come up with, but back in about 2009, there was a group that came together called the Wisconsin Tribal Justice Committee. Uh, they were just made up of, of folks that were um, around the Green Bay area that was trying to um, talk about uh, issues that, that were affecting us here in, in northeast Wisconsin and across the state is, is related to um, uh, tribal issues. Uh, here's a, a list of those, those different agencies and different tribes that uh, were kind of at the table. Um, as you see, that there, we, we have four of the, the 11 tribes here in Wisconsin that, that were represented by different, different people throughout the, the, the time. And I'll get to that in a minute. The uh, Wisconsin Judicare, the Great Lakes Center Tribal Council, Fox Valley Tech, UWGB. Uh, we have a really good relationship with our uh, state partners at the Department of Corrections and our Office of Justice Assistance. As they were, they were talking about the the different uh, issues that that were coming up. A lot of it all came back to recidivism rates, and and that that re type type of of mind mind thought, and. They were led by Ada Deer, and if any of you know who Ada is, um, she's she's a, a, a very motivated person, and recidivism is one of those things that we're, we're at the top of her list, so it became the top of our list, I guess. Um, but one of the things that they found out was, and many of you probably know this about recidivism, 
but if, if with, with more and more offenses, the, the recidivism rate uh, increases. Um, about half of the offenders were, you know, and they're they're between 18 and 23. Males had a higher recidivism rate than the the females. And American Indians um, were right there at the top of the the recidivism rates. In in Wisconsin, they they did a, a population check of our, our Wisconsin uh, Native American prisoners inside of the, the institutions. Um, I kind of have those slides backwards, but between 07 and 09, um, it shows the, the number of, of offenders that were in the, the, the Wisconsin prison system, and they're, they're self-identified. Now, the Department of Corrections doesn't uh, track the tribe that they're from or, or which, which tribe that they're from, but simply that they're, they're self-reporting as Native American. Now, those, those numbers may or may not be skewed by somebody who doesn't want them to know that they're Native American, or by those that think that they can get something additional, some additional services by self-reporting that. So I, I'd like to think that those numbers are, are pretty close to, to being, being accurate. One of the things that drove Ada to uh, to this is that uh, the, the disproportionate uh, makeup of, of the, the population in there. With the Native Americans in Wisconsin only being about 1% of the population, um, we took up 3% of the, the inmate population through the Wisconsin uh, prison system. And then once uh, they were released from the prison system, uh, they also made up about 3% uh, of the offender population. So that, that, that's pretty consistent with what was uh, going on throughout the, the prison systems and, and going through there and, and trying to make sure that we're, we're trying to look at what things that we could do to, to, help, uh, to, to help our folks. And then uh, there was a breakdown of the, the male versus the, the female populations that, that were, that were self-reported. Now with the the, the revocations between 2004 and 2007, about 4% of those were the were, were made up of Native American offenders. Um, you know what the the reason was for that it, it varies, but I, I think one of the things that uh, was at the forefront of it, and it goes back to the social issues, and we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. But uh, the do they really have the skills, and, and where are they going back to, and how is how is that uh, affecting their their success rates to to not reoffend? Now, for, for incarceration, I, I think we all know uh, for both incarceration and supervision, uh, there, there's a, some costs tied to that. So for these numbers are from 2008, uh, but it's costing about $83 a day to house somebody in our, in our state prison system and uh, just, just under $7 a day for the, the supervision. And where's that money coming from? I think we all know it's coming from, from our taxes. So that there was a, a real need, not only fiscally, but for a, a from a community standpoint, to, to do something for that. Um, so that that was the Wisconsin Tribal Justice Committee. We we got a bunch more uh, folks together uh, from from basically the, the same agencies, but we included a lot more people than just the the, the small core group um, to to form the the Wisconsin Tribal Community Reintegration Program. Then there was a second chance grant that. Uh, just happened to be coming out around the same time um, from the Bureau of Justice Assistance that uh, that we decided to, to get into um, to into a, a pilot project to include the Menominee, Oneida, and Stockbridge communities um, with, with the intention of once we got our, our feet wet and figured out what to do and how to do it that we would expand to the other 11 tribes in Wisconsin. Now we are a public law 280 tribe and I don't know if, if Everybody that, that's on this uh, call is from Wisconsin. But um, one of the things that we were able to do, and we have a very good relationship with our Department of Corrections, um, to, to kind of figure out where those uh, offenders were being were going to return and trying to figure out which tribes that uh, we could focus on. So we, we, we took the, the Maumee, Stockbridge, and Oneida. Um, those, those numbers, we're, we're at about 100 right now that are, are close, are about 36 months from from release. And 
we're going to be focused on, on those three reservations for those folks that are returning back to um, back to our reservations. And one, one of the things that, that we've came, come up with, actually it was uh, Ada's idea, but uh, in, instead of calling them offenders and ex-cons and all of those, those negative type of uh, connotations for those folks coming back, um, we, we have decided to call them returning, offend, returning citizens. Um, so, so once we decided that, that we're going to focus on those three tribes, and we included the Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council, we went to all three of those tribes to, uh, to the governing bodies, to, our, to the business committees and the, the decision makers, and presented this idea to them. Based on their, their feedback, we were able to get three resolutions in support of that, along with a resolution from um, Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council, to support this program to, to move forward with it. Getting four entities like that together and, and getting something in support of anything collectively is, is difficult. But uh, this wasn't. It was uh, very, very simple to, to to get that idea through the, the through the process. Now the, the advisory committee uh, makes up is made up of the, the three tribes involved: the Nyah Menominee, Stockbridge, Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council, our Office of Justice Assistance, Department of Corrections. Not only the uh, the, the prison system, but we also have uh, our community corrections folks and our, our tribal liaison that comes up from Milwaukee for the, for the meetings, uh, Fox Valley Technical College and Wisconsin Judicare. Now, one of the things that uh, we had to do before we were able to hire any of the, the ladies that, uh, that, that we have, and we're very fortunate to, to get the, the three ladies that uh, are going to actually doing, be doing the work. Um, so, so there wasn't any sort of uh, perception that one tribe would be benefiting more than the other. Uh, we decided that uh, the Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council would be the supervisor of the, the ladies, that, uh, the, the caseworker and the director, so they could uh, kind of not, not have that, that conflict or perceived conflict that, you know, when I was getting all the services while everybody's ignoring, while they're ignoring the, the folks from Stockbridge. So we decided to, to do it that way. So our, our three ladies are actually uh, um, employees of Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council. Um, and before they were hired, we had to send two people down to uh, a conference in Washington, D.C. about the, the grant and what the, what the whole process was going to be. Uh, quite frankly, because I was the program director or program coordinator, whatever it is that I have to sign up on the grant for, um, I, got, I lost the rock, paper, scissors, and I got to go out there along with Jeff Muse, who is the uh, executive director at Glitzy, and uh, Joseph Hott's supervisor. Quite frankly, my idea of reintegration for you know my most of my entire career, I was working nights on patrol out on the street, uh, was simply reintegration was putting handcuffs back on the offender and sticking them back in prison. After uh, after that that conference, I, I think one of those things that that we all have every every now and again is one of those aha moments and that that whole shift of, of paradigm that I understand now that we need to provide services to those folks getting out so they don't reoffend. Because if we put that effort in on the front end, we won't have to deal with them later on. And if we're able to be successful in, in getting them not only the, the, the services and, and skills that they want and, and need, we can, we can save ourselves a lot of headache down, in, down the road, not only for that, for that victim, and that, or the, not only for the returning citizen and their family, but all of those potential victims that, that are out in our communities just to make our community a, a better place. Uh, because we don't, we only have three people to to do this. We had to focus on uh, some some very specific and and geographical challenges. Um, so we, we chose to to provide services at the Green Bay Correctional Institute, so our Sanger Bauer, Sanger Powers Correctional Center, um, our Oshkosh Prison, and Tachita. The Tachita is a a female prison, so we'll also be doing male and female. Uh, returning citizens to provide these services to. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dosa Hot, and she's going to tell you, talk to you about what she is, or what her and her, her ladies are doing. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dosa Delgado. Um, 
welcome you all to to this webinar. Hopefully, I won't um, be. Hopefully, I'll be able to give you enough information at least to get your program started if if that's where you're at. Um, I'm the director of the reintegration program, and I have two caseworkers, Rebecca Chavez and Marianne Morris, who are um, both bring different kinds of skills to the program. Um, Ms. Chavez has um, been able to. Uh, be involved in halfway houses where people that have come out of corrections and and alcohol or treatment facilities have been she's been able to work with them, and Ms. Morris has some uh, expertise in program development. Um, the first two months of the program, um, we met with the advisory committee, which um, um, Rich had taken the time to kind of mention those different individuals from the three tribes and um, other entities. Uh, we've toured the different reservations, Oneida in particular, as well as Menominee and Stockbridge. And because we're hitting a, a pretty large area, it's been a little bit more challenging to try and um, get uh, the staff, the caseworkers, familiar with the area because they have to know where the programs are, um, where the different facilities are, um, where the services can be obtained, and get names and faces with the different programs that they're going to make referrals for. Um, we've set up our offices with the resources, basic resources that we've needed. And um, our first challenge was probably about the first week we attended the business committee meeting, which is the Oneida government here that oversees um, the uh, tribe. And we presented, I presented on their pardon law. One of the issues that was coming up is that they wanted to have it so that the those that were offended by the um, by the, the returning citizens would have a say on whether they were able to get jobs or not. And so I spoke on, on behalf of the returning citizens to not have that part included in the um, language of the new pardon law so that we realized that the individuals that are returning have already done their time. They're already on probation and parole. They probably will have gone through some type of programming while they were um, in the institutions. and. Um, it didn't make sense to put another kind of barrier, you know, another boulder that they had to go over in order to get uh, obtain a job. And so I kind of spoke on that behalf and, and uh, wrote that up and submitted that to the business committee for, the, for their consideration. Um, we've met with spiritual advisors in, in the different communities, um, those being Stockbridge Muncie Community, the United Community, and Menominee. In Stockbridge Muncie, we've been meeting with Molly Miller, who has introduced us to um, intergenerational trauma, um, trying to do some healing around some of the um, issues that a lot of our inmates will be, um, returning citizens will be facing, and a lot of them coming from the boarding school experience and how all that comes into play. Um, so we're going to be doing some training with her, and we just started that last week and that will go on for four more weeks. Um, in the United Community, we've met with Bob Brown, who is one of our Bear Clan chief here in the United Community. We'll also be meeting with Ron Hill and Annette Cornelius, who are some of our spiritual healers in the community also. In Menominee Community, we've met with David Greeno, who's one of the cultural spiritual advisors for the Menominee Nation. And when, when, when we go into the different communities, we have to real, realize and be mindful that, that all of these three different tribes have different spiritual entities included in them. So we're not only going with Native American spirituality, we're also going to make contacts with the different congregations in each of the communities. But some of those to mention um, are the Big Drum Society, the Longhouse community here, the Native American church, and of course things that um, a lot of um, people, Native Americans in the system are familiar with the sweat lodges. So we're going to be making those connections there. I think another thing to note with the Menominee community, there's lots of smaller communities there. They're kind of broken up between 7 and 15 miles from each other. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to be able to make those connections because if they're going back to their communities, we have um, about four different communities we're working with on the Menominee Reservation. That includes Middle Village, Krishina, Neopit, and South Branch. So all these communities are about 7 to 15 minutes away from each other. So that means if we have somebody returning, they may end up living in Shano, but may have to drive about 20 miles in order to get to maybe Neopit or Zor is another community um, to find to get services to find these spiritual advisors. 
So those are going to be challenges, challenges for us. Um, so we're going to continue to build on those resources and build rapport with each community because, you know, we're from, for, I'm from this community, Oneida, um, but we have to build rapport with the other two communities, um, especially with Rebecca and Marianne because they're not familiar with um, the resources that are out there. Um, we've had agencies, meetings with agencies for child support, um, domestic violence, um, Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, Education, Housing, Pardon Departments, and um, another thing is, is realizing that each, each tribe that we'll be working with have different laws and different rules and policies. And so if we know what the laws are for the Pardon Department for Oneida, they may not be the same for Menominee or Stockbridge Muncie. So we have to learn what all those are so that when we're assisting our returning citizens, we know what we need to let the, um, we know the information that we have to have in order for them to be able to um, apply for a pardon to be able to work for that community. Um, we began um, the process of developing a resource file and these resource files will be divided by the tribes and they'll be broken down by each of their communities. Like I had mentioned, uh, Menominee has Kashina, Neopit, South Branch, and Zor, those different communities that are all are part of the Menominee uh, tribe. And so we have to break them up so that we, we have an idea of where each one of them will be coming from and going to. Um, so to give you an example of that, for Menominee, um, this is their seal. And one of the flyers we developed will be having the seal, all three of the seals from each tribe on our flyers so that people are aware of what nation that, that we service. Um, the Menominee Tribal Clinic has the WIC Diabetes Prevention, Nutrition, all kinds of um, um, health-related um, services, tobacco use, in order to be able to try and um, stop smoking, and infra infant health, because some people will be coming out and maybe have children or um, will be having children as they come out. Um, some other things that Menominee County Health and Human Services provides, prevention, early intervention, um, counseling, treatment, and other supportive services. So there's just a really large amount of services that are offered with each tribe. And again, even though I may say health and human services, that may not mean the same thing as it does in Oneida. They may ha have different programs in each um, department, which is why we have to develop our resource um, files so that we can be sure that we're making the correct referrals for the different agencies, depending on what tribe they're coming from. Um, another thing to note is that um, different tribes have certain programs that are only um, available to them, to tribal members within that tribe. But there are some tribes, Oneida, for example, has different programs that are available to any Native Americans. So Menominee and Stockbridge Muncie can receive services from Oneida, depending on what they are. And that may be the same for Menominee and Stockbridge Muncie. And so that's another reason that we have to put our resources in order so we know that if somebody that is Menominee is deciding to live in Green Bay, they're going to need services from Oneida, then we got to find out what kinds of services are available to them within the Oneida uh, community. Um, one of the real influential and, and um, uh, assets that Menominee has is Manasakia. It's a wellness center, and they pro provide a wide range of treatment, intervention, prevention, and non-therapy services for drugs, which means they're using different kinds of teas and herbs and things like that. Um, they provide alcohol, drug, mental health, domestic violence, and residential care and services, any kinds of AODA treatment. And um, so all of these things kind of get funneled in through the Manasakia area, which is also located in Middle Village. So it's a halfway point between Kashina and Neopit. Um, the Community Resource Center, um, this is an example of um, what Menominee offers at their Community Resource Center is temporary assistance to needy fam families, the TANF program, and job training. Whereas Oneida, our community resource center is primarily focusing on education. So that's why it's important for um, the caseworkers, Marianne and Rebecca, to understand when certain words are used, you have to know what 
tribe you're talking about and what services are provided there because between just Menominee and Oneida, the community, community resource center are two different um, areas. Um, Menominee Higher Education Office office, um, the adult vocational training and adult education program, provides assistance to help them advance in the workplace and pursue higher education in college or any kind of technical school. Um, the College of Menominee Nation um, provides technical certificates to and four-year degrees, outreach services to the community. One of the things about the uh, College of Menominee is they have a transportation, they received a grant from the state and that grant was able to service um, Menominee people or people in the Menominee area to provide transportation to the Green Bay area. So it's specifically for um, College of Menominee students or people that are in their certificate programs. And so they have a transportation, this grant covers for people moving from, that are living in Kashina can catch the transit in Kashina um, at the college or else anywhere else on the reservation there in Menominee and travel up to Green Bay and maybe attend college courses at the Green Bay campus. And that transportation happens in the spring and the fall, it happens five days or five times a day that the transportation goes back and forth so that it can accommodate just about anything. And they'll also give people rides to the, um, um, the clinics or the hospitals in the Green Bay area or um, the stores and things like that. The other thing that they recently started is they're starting courses, outreach courses at the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation. And so what they'll be doing is they'll be um, trying to expand that transportation to go into Stockbridge Muncie territories there. And so people that maybe want to take courses in Stockbridge can get transportation, but they also can um, take courses at the college, at the, at the Kashina campus, so they can use that transportation and ride the, um, the bus for free as long as they have their, their ID. Um, then they have Menominee Child, Child Support, and this provides services to children and families regarding paternity, child support, and also parenting skills. Um, the Tribal Social Services provides support to families with catastrophic or medical emergencies. Catastrophic would be, for example, if somebody lost a limb when they were working or has become terminally ill and is unable to work and things like that. They also provide a burial expenses, bur burial expenses support and kinship care. And kinship care is defined as if a, a relative, um, if a, there's a child, that needs to be taken care of by maybe an aunt, uncle, or a grandma, or a cousin, that kinship care will help give them funding to help take care of that child. Um, Menominee and Tribe Emergency Shelter Program. This is the Eagle's Nest, it's called, um, their facility is called, and it is located up in Neopit. And it provides shelter and supportive services to homeless individuals and families. And so people that are coming out of corrections or returning citizens are able to utilize this system. And if they can take the time, and we met with them um, last week, if um, some of our returning citizens can take the time and, and are willing to locate up there in the OPIT, they can possibly get a home there if they make advanced time um, to let them know that they're coming out and then they'll make the arrangements so that they can be there. Um, then there's the Menominee Tribal Housing Department with home improvements, uh, loans to get homes, and low rent programs. Um, they also have a food distribution program with commodities, uh, their public transit, um, public transportation, I kind of talked about that again, and the Menominee Tribe Elder Services. Um, they have delivery meals, um, Meals on Wheels and Personal Care, and they also have a CBRF. Um, the Stockbridge Muncie Nation also has a lot of similar programs, family services, um, advocacy for families and housing, uh, legal advocacy and counseling, and they have a homeless shelter and transitional living places. Um, they assist people with independent living skills and after school prevention programs. They also have an Indian Child Welfare program with supplies, outreach, and prevention services, and economic support programs assist individuals in applying for Badger Care Plus, and that's like medical assistance, um, home energy assistance, food share, child care services, TANF again, 
Um, the TANF program in particular is for individuals that have their children and are looking for some assistance financially and are unable to find a job. What TANF will do is it will pay them um, a certain amount of money per month and based on how many are in the family. And then what they um, are required to do is they are required to volunteer to work at a facility for up to 40 hours, but usually 20 hours, and then 20 of those hours are spent looking for a job. And um, what happens is TANF basically will pay their wages for working at that facility. And fortunately for us, um, we have a TANF program here in Oneida, and I'll be developing some job descriptions to be able to get two TANF workers at our office to help us with some administrative work, you know, with filing and and just paperwork and things like that. So we'll be able to uh, give some some people some skills on being able to um, help them in finding jobs. So that's kind of one of the things that are there. They also assist with resume job preparation. They have a food distribution department, um, packaged foods, and medical transportation. Um, they have a health and wellness center that provides your medical, dental, and pharmacy and health specialty. Uh, special specialist referrals and a wellness center also provides the ODA treatment, family and couples counseling. And then Oneida, Oneida probably has one of the most uh, programs available and it's probably because we have a larger population and we're located closer to the city of Green Bay. And so they have social services departments, again TANF, which I've already talked about, higher education, the same thing providing um, education, uh, technical, and two- and four-year degrees, um, child, child support services to assist people in trying to meet with families and um, set up their, their services where they have to pay child support, and then they have a behavioral health program that covers uh, a rate of psychological and AODA treatment services um, here on the reservation. They also have a Wisconsin Shares program, and a lot of the programs that Oneida has has a lot of different like pockets of money that help take care of child care and other services that they may need. And so that, that was uh, real beneficial in finding out about um, the Wisconsin Shares program. They have Native uh, Employment Works program to help people get jobs. Uh, general assistance for Oneida members, and a food cart program, which basically is like a debit card that they can use at almost any of the stores in the Green Bay area. Um, we have uh, state respite care. This is primarily for people that maybe have um, a little bit of stress and they need a break, and so they can provide child care for that, and so that people can, you know, just go and exercise or take care of errands and things like that without having to run the children around with them. Energy assistance, they have funeral and cemetery aids, badger care again that I mentioned. We have a fitness center, health center, culture and language program. Um, one of the things that um, my staff and I did is we created a statistical flyer for information on the three tribes. And so I've um, put all this information on here on, on this um, on these slides, but it all is compiled at the very end of this that basically shows us the improving outcomes of the released inmates, we can create a stronger, healthier community. Um, here's our contact information for uh, my office. And this is the sources that we've pulled information from, the, the statistics that are on this flyer right here, just the facts. So this is one of the flyers that we put out, and, and um, we attended public events so that people can see the statistical information, because sometimes numbers are easier to kind of grasp the concept. And so this is some more statistical information of what we had from May since we started mid-May until July. Um, and so you can take a look at those numbers you know, at your leisure. And so if there's any um, concluding things that anybody has or questions, we can kind of uh, pass it back over to Kimberly. And this is Jim uh, once again. I wanted to thank uh, very much uh, Kim and Rich and, and Josat for those uh, terrific presentations. I'd also like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar today, but we don't want you to go away just yet. Uh, we have some very important information we'd like to share with you.
the um, Department of, of the oops, the Depart uh, Department of the Interior and the Department of Justice seek your input on the draft of the Tribal Justice Plan that's formally uh, formally called a Long-Term Detention Plan. I moved through one of the slides fairly. two days from today. We're also providing to you right now some information about how you access the final draft of the Tribal Justice Plan. It is fairly simple. I've gone it myself and done this. And you can submit your comments on the draft uh, through this process. I encourage you to take a look at that slide and make those comments, submit those comments by this Thursday, and be a part of this all-important process. We'd also like to share with you some useful resources that have been developed to assist tribal justice agencies with reentry planning and information sharing. Uh, these resources are available free online. You can either Google them or you can contact Kim Cobb, who is one of our participants here today at the APPA, and she will be very happy to get you exactly what you need in support of your important work. This is the contact information for Kim and for Rich and for TOSAT, and um, in addition to that, of course, as I said, all of our presenters here today are very interested in following up with you on any information that was provided. You can answer your questions and offer some additional insights into the good things that they are doing. I know that we have perhaps just a few minutes left at this time for some questions, and so let me re-describe how it is we can go about uh, soliciting just a few of those in the remaining time that we have left. You can choose to raise your hand using the, right, the hand button on the toolbar in the right hand side of your screen, or you can chat in your question as it sets forth uh, in, um, on that particular slide. And so with uh, that by way of um, presentation here, um, we'd like to solicit your questions and answer those that, that uh, you might like to present and offer to any one of our speakers at this time. Okay, this is um, Kim Cobb again with APPA. We've had a couple of questions submitted through the chat. Um, I'm not exactly sure who specifically they're directed to. Um, I'm just going to read them and if any of the panelists um, would like to respond, feel free to do so. Um, the first question comes from Nancy Sabin. Um, she asks, how can we approach tribal reentry issues in a more collaborative manner and have funding provided for all partners in the collaboration? Historically, funding is given to one organization that uses the majority, if not all of the funds, or they distribute funds to a few organizations in the collaboration. Um, and Rich, I don't know if, if you all want to take a first stab at that question. Uh, sure. Um, well, one of the things that, that we've done is that uh, Oneida is the grant recipient for our second chance grant. And uh, for, for the most part, none of the other tribes are, are receiving any, any funding. And uh, much of their time, which it's not a lot, um, but those folks that are part of the advisory board are, are providing their time as in kind. So. Um, about the only one that, that we're paying is Glitzy because they're the, the, the actual employers. So I guess to, to answer that question directly, I don't have an answer for it because of how we've set up our program. Um, it, it isn't to, to recoup uh, any of those, those costs, but simply to provide this service to, to our, our, our community. Okay. Thanks, Rich. Um, we have another question here. Um, from Dr. Leon Getter, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, what is the degree of staff commitment, satisfaction, and effort observed in relation to program outcomes based on the quality of information shared? Is this data collected on any level? Do any of the panelists have any response to that? The degree of commitment, satisfaction, and effort observed in relation to program outcomes. And I'm not exactly sure if they're referring to participant outcomes or the, the level of satisfaction from the participant perspective or from the agency perspective. Okay, this is Jill Pack. 
Um, I guess I would I would be the one to answer that. Um, we're in the process of the. There was a training in regard to the the data information that will be collected that is required as part of the grant, and so that is how we are compiling our information, and it will be based on the people that we are going to be working with in the prisons and being able to go in there and work with them six to eight months before they even get out. And then we will work with them for about a year after they are out. And so the data that we collect will basically be from those referrals that we will get, which will come from the agents that are working um, in the prison system. And, um, and so that's, that's how we're going to do it. You know, there's a, a process that the grant requires that we have to fill out for the data information. And so there's also um, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet on how you compile all your information. And it shows who succeeded, who's, who has not, who's been in a pre-release -pro, pre program and a post-release program. We're also collecting data that has to do with um, uh, referrals that we're getting and phone calls and letters of people that are already out that are not part of our program. So we're also keeping that data so that in the future, if that's needed, and we decide to write for a grant for that specifically, we'll already have the data for it. So, so I think uh, to, to sum it up, to, to, to answer the, the very, to answer the question, um, we don't have that, we haven't been in existence long enough to have that data. Okay. And we have another question from Brian Colgan, um, and this is probably um, another one directed at you all in Wisconsin. Um, is it difficult to obtain the Bureau of Prisons um, mental health, substance abuse, and sex offender treatment records, and is this going to change? Uh, we're not working with the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, we're just working with the Wisconsin state institutions. We, we haven't uh, reached out to the, the feds yet. And this is uh, Jim from the, the federal side. I suspect that that information, although obviously it is, it is maintained by the Bureau of Prisons for much the same reasons that Rich is sort of uh, implicitly indicating, would be problematic for us to release. There may be some case-specific circumstances under which, which we in the federal system might be able to get that. But again, because of the, the nature of it, it might be uh, more difficult to release, certainly publicly. And, um, but those are the kinds of things perhaps we could answer on a case-specific or there's a specific need for that. Uh, that's the kind of thing that perhaps our office, U.S. Attorney's Office, could address, at least uh, through the um, uh, U.S. Bureau of Prisons as well. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Ann Dahl, and she asks, um, did you get money to develop housing as part of your grant, or did you have to do with what was available? And I'm assuming that's addressed to you all, Rich. Um, no and yes. No, no, we didn't get any, any money for the, the housing stuff, and we have to make do with what we have. Um, one of the things that, that we're having to deal with and trying to, to I don't want, I want to say get around, but to, to deal with the, the issue is that many of these offenders coming out are, are um, convicted of a felony, and there's a lot of federal money that our, our tribes have with the, the federal housing programs that uh, felons can't live in those types of, of um funded houses, so we're, we're, we're trying to, to wade through that. The other thing is um, that there was recently a law that was passed that said that the that tribes can use federal funding to develop housing for people that are returning to communities that have felony records. Um, another conversation that I had with um, our housing authority is that they were, they, they've been talking amongst themselves, and, and we had met with them here in Oneida, and they're talking about possibly trying to put together a program where they can um, apply for some funding through the federal government for housing, where they hire those individuals that are returning to the communities, and they build their own homes, and then they can apply for those homes that they're building, and they would build, be, build them someone separate other than the housing sites where most of them cannot reside at. So that's just a discussion that's being that's happening right now, but um, it's just an idea that that people seem to be supporting. And of course, there'll be a lot of groundwork that has to happen before that'll occur. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, just as a side note, for those of you that have your hands raised, if you want to take a moment and type in your question in the chat, um, we will do our best to get back to you after um, the webinar to address your question. Um, so please just take a moment and do that. Um, we've got time for one more question, and it comes from Laureen Villad. And again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, why is it with the importance of loss of cultural identity is at the bottom of the services when it is the most important for healing and wellness? And I'm assuming that's addressed to you all, Rich. Hello again. Um, actually, that is one of the ways that this grant was approved is that culture and spirituality is going to be, be implemented into the Windows to Work program. And that program exists already within the system. And so what we are going to be doing is we're going to be revamping it and including culture and spirituality into that Windows to Work program. And that's one of the reasons that the grant had, um, had been accepted. And so that's actually our number one goal is to be able to have that in there. Okay. Well, it looks like that's all the time that we have for today. Um, so I'll turn it over to Jim to make some concluding remarks. Good. Thank you very much, Kim. In conclusion today, I would like to re-acknowledge and thank very much the terrific contributions of our presenters, Kimberly Cobb, Rich Van Boxel, and Josaat uh, Delgado. Um, all three of them, as you can plainly see and know from their comments and their presentations um, on your monitors today, are incredibly well informed in these areas and truly take them up on their offers today to follow up with them, the emails, phone numbers, and especially, as Kim was just saying, those of you who have questions that did not get to uh, have those answered during the course of our last portion here, we will try to do our very best to get some answers to you. To the extent that those are incomplete or insatisfac unsatisfactory, do take us up on that offer to follow up uh, with all of them. I'd also like to acknowledge, again, the terrific assistance of Marina Henry, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, in putting this all together, and very much encourage all of you who are interested in the subject matter of today's webinar to follow up on the remaining webinars in this series that are likewise going to be um, presented and, and uh, advertised in the uh, days and weeks just ahead. For now, I again want to thank all of you who participated as attendees in this program. We look forward to your participation in the kinds of programs and projects that were the subjects of our presentation today. Uh, we thank you for participation, and although we're concluding today, we extend to all of you on behalf of the panelists here today, extend to all of you our best wishes for using the information, incorporating into your existing programs, and creating new things, new um, enterprises, new projects and programs that can really uh, not only ensure the um, effective information sharing that we talked about, but most importantly, the reentry of important members back into our Native American communities and other communities in which we are, uh, to which we um, um, are responsible and for which we are responsible as leaders in our communities. I thank you very much and best wishes to all of you. Have a good afternoon.